Well, thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate everybody for uh, taking the time. Um, Actually, you teach a uh, security class or an intro to cybersecurity class at one of the, the local colleges up in Greenville. So and it's a mandatory required class, so students have to come. So I always appreciate it when people choose to come to my activity. So I really appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the time today. Um, if you have questions or if you want to chat afterwards, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm uh, MD Holcomb and Twitter. Uh, my outside email address is michael at .com. That's just for some of the side project work I do. Um, my day job, I'm actually one of the information security directors at Floor. And just real quick, they just kind of, kind of set the, the scene. So we're one of the larger engineering and construction companies in the world. Uh, we're Fortune 152 right now. Uh, we've been as high as 110 since I've been there uh, for about seven years. My team's primarily responsible for vulnerability management, penetration testing, and also incident detection and response. So we're very defensive and offense, which can be good and bad and you know, part of the conversation. Um, and industrial controls as well. So this is a, a power plant. It's actually the largest gas-powered power plant that we have in the Americas right now that I was at a couple months ago. Uh, lots of fun stories from there. And we'll talk a little bit about also getting into IoT and, and industrial control, but a lot of this conversation is really going back to the basics, not only in vulnerability management, but how we build that and how we actually see some vulnerabilities the same, whether it could be at floor. So we have about 80,000 IP addresses that are live internally spread out around the world. So we have not as big as some, but bigger than most and have a pretty fairly significant large test bed, of course, to see a lot of different issues across. Um, so lots of stories that, that we can talk about as we, we go along. Um, I will throw a plug in for B-Sides Greenville. So uh, it will be March 30th. Uh, so we'd love to have you guys in the upstate if, uh, if you can make it up. Uh, but uh, anyway, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. So this presentation, I initially started writing uh, I was actually sitting at Panera with my girlfriend one day. It's our work day place, right? We're sitting at Panera, and I was actually trying to explain to her the main focus of my job, which is finding vulnerabilities and working with different people in IT to get them fixed so we no longer have the issue where it can be attacked or taken advantage of. And while we were sitting there having this conversation, uh, one of the local newscasters came in with a friend and they sat down right next to us and he started having this conversation with her about, uh, with the friend he was with about um, Brene Brown. Anybody know who Brene Brown is? I hadn't until I, I was eavesdropping on this conversation because they were sitting right next to us. Uh, so she actually has one of the top, I think still top five TED Talks of all time. And she, uh, she's a psychologist and she talks about this idea of being vulnerable and being vulnerable in your personal lives and your relationships. You know, I'm sitting there with my girlfriend and trying to explain to her. I'm like, yes, that's great for your relationship and with your significant other. That's not what we're talking about when it comes to my job, right? I'm the type of person that I will go a couple minutes out of my way to make sure I don't have to turn left because the chances of a car accident, right, occurring are going to be a lot more if. I'm just making right-hand turns. So now I'm also very practical. I like to think, or utilitarian, uh, which is where the util set comes from. Place, but the idea is so if as long as it's just an extra minute or two, I'll go that direction. If it's more than that, I'll just I'll take my chances with the left-hand turn. Right. But I like to think I'm very practical. Again, very utilitarian, and in, in the work that I do, and whether it's at Floor, which is my full-time job, or a couple of the other side projects uh, that I have as well, and so. When we start talking about the vulnerabilities that we see, a lot of them, and we'll talk a lot about, we'll touch on finding web applications in the environment. It's not necessarily a web application security talk, so then sometimes it scares people away, so don't worry. Um, but I do actually like to go back to Panera, because A, I do a lot of work out of Panera, just like I was mentioning. Um, and back in April, they actually had a big, considered a breach, right? And that a researcher, a security researcher, was able to go to their website and with a simple URL, right, dump out the entire database of all the users, including myself, that had signed up for the Panera Users Rewards Program. Right? So they didn't have social security numbers or credit card numbers, except for the last four digits. Right? 
Um, and then you know, they had your email addresses. They could see the point balance of the theory was, oh, somebody could take all those reward points I've earned and they, they could steal them and get a free bagel. Okay, more power to you if you could pull that off, right? Um, I kind of gravitate back to this one also. That it got lost with Equifax because a month later, the Equifax breach came out. And so everybody heard about Equifax. I mean, most businesses, like, and it packed all of us also at a personal level, right, as far as uh, allowing all of our personal information to be out there. Um, so Equifax, at the end of the day, though, was really just somebody not patching the server, right? Though? So it was a very easy attack to pull off, right? It didn't take any nuance or technical knowledge, really, that was any level of sophistication, where I definitely give the gentleman that was doing the research for the Panera Bread site, that yeah, he actually put some work in. It sounded like it was still very easy to find, but he went through it and actually found where he could get to where he could dump all that customer information out of the database, right? And he did the right thing. He tried to do responsible disclosure. The worst part about the breach was the Panera IT folks that he was trying to work with weren't working with him. And so it got really ugly really fast, so. Um, and we'll talk about <laughs> Panera a few more times as, as, as we go through. But as we start to shift, and, and we've seen over the last five or really even almost 10 years now in some of the environments that we've been in, is that we have a growing number of devices that we're connecting to the network. And whether we talk about regular PCs and laptops and servers, or if we do get into talking about IoT, right? And so we have our thermostats on, on the network along with our HVAC systems, I have a friend that does a lot of um, building automation systems. So uh, we actually knocked over the building automation system in our corporate headquarters, oops, accidentally, uh, with a basic Nessus vulnerability scan, believe it or not. Um, and so all the door controls shut. So you could get out of the facility, right, for safety purposes, right, or it makes you sense. Could block someone in right. and hold them hostage. Yeah, well, thankfully they do fail open, so in the event, especially if you think there's a fire, people are still able to exit the building, but nobody was able to get into any of the doors. And basically our corporate headquarters at Floor is about a thousand employees, and I think 700 of them are executives. <laughs> so there were a few people that weren't very happy that they couldn't get into any doors. So. One of the things I, one of the things I'm always concerned, um, in the back of my head, I'm always worried about with wireless. Theoretically, all you have to do, something you have to do is like stick yeah, especially if you're talking wireless. Yeah, I've been doing a lot more wireless work these days. So you actually have to like splice, splice the cord, which then is pretty obvious. So if you ever saw like Ocean's Eleven, that was <laughs> that was in the movie too. Yeah, it's, we don't get too far into that. So everything we're talking about in this presentation is done over the wire so and we've seen some attackers we've we've definitely experienced advanced persistent threats we've had the nation states the chinese the russian probably the americans right that, that actually target you know us as a global company in some way shape or form i'm not naive um, but yeah it's a big part of this presentation is is understanding that if it has an ip address if it communicates right if i can touch it right if it's especially a packet out to the internet Right? It is vulnerable, right? period, the end. Right? And so we have to start looking at where those vulnerabilities exist. Well, they're everywhere. Right? We still think of, and, and it's not, I need to probably point it out a little bit more on this, this slide, is with printers probably is still today one of the most overlooked. We talk about, right, could be IoT. I still almost think of them as industrial controls, right? Because industrial controls, we talk about you have a system that sits like at a power plant, right? And it has an IP address and an operating system, and it's supposed to, right, make physical changes in the real world. It's what a printer does, right? It spins gears and it spits out paper, and and so when we start looking at, you know, where are these issues? You know, it's, I do a lot of incident detection and response as well, and of course. That stereotypical situation we've talked about for 20 years now still exists, right? If you have the SOC analyst sitting there, see, sees a potential intrusion that's alerted on, right? and then they go back and they realize, oh, that's just a printer 
never mind, right? And go and ignore it. And at the same time, more than likely, an attacker could sit there on that printer and have full control over that device, using it to connect to and attack the rest of the network to pivot from. Right? The same thing with IoT devices. The thing about printer is it just convert. Basically, it just takes the data you send to it. It converts it into into something that's readable on your, on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, and that all happens inside the printer. So theoretically, if even if something doesn't look, looks like a printer on your onto your computer, it could just be re like an HP or Photos or something. It could just be pretending anything. It could be actually something else that's pretending to be an HP Photos, Mark, right? And it's interpreting the data you send into it. And, they can, and then whoever's hacking you can use it. Yeah, the printer is just another computer, right? It looks like it's an HP, right? It's a Xerox. Maybe it's one of those tall multifunction device, right? It's like this tall. And at the end of the day, it runs Windows. It runs Linux. It runs Linux. How often are we getting those patched? How often are we getting them updated? A lot of the new ones are running Max Android. Some of the new printers are Some of them. Well, and that's why you see a lot of industrial controls also switching to. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, when you think you, I can connect to that system, I don't care if it's a printer, a server, a workstation, a laptop, a phone, as long as I can get access and run commands on it, as an attacker, right, that's a win. So one of the things I like to talk about a lot, and a lot of people still haven't really got to the critical security controls too much. How many of you, by show of hands, are familiar with the critical security controls? Usually there's a few people in the room. Okay, we got one. So the idea is critical security controls, and they just had a, a more recent update in March, right? came out of a project that the SANS Institute had originally started, and then they shifted over to the Center for Internet Security, uh, which was a group that was originally kind of formed by the NSA, the FBI, back in the day when everybody had their suggestions on how to secure systems, and they decided we need to put one group together to manage all of this. Right? And so the SANS Institute handed over the critical security controls, and the idea is here's 20 areas in your information security program that you need to focus on. And that if you apply these, and then depending on who you talk to, it will protect you against 98% of the cyber threats that are out there. Now the idea being is that the nation states are the other 2%, and there's nothing that you're going to be able to do uh, to protect your organizations against them. Right? So when you look at the critical security controls, though, and you look at them from top to bottom, the nice thing is, and this is where I love using this when working, especially with different executives or other folks in IT, is that it's a prioritized list. So the idea is we should start and have the most impact by implementing the controls at the top of the list versus the controls that are at the very end. So the very first, and they really talk about the first two items, right, really make up asset management. I don't know about you guys, but there aren't a lot of organizations that do a really good job at asset management, right? There's a few, right? But for the most part, asset management, it's hard, right? It's the struggle is real, right? So uh, thankfully this year they bumped up vulnerability management, kind of do the continuous vulnerability assessment remediation up to three from four. And then we can look at the other end of the extreme, right? Where so number 20, we see penetration tests and red team, right? So that's both my ends of, of my world, right? And then we talk about incident response and management. And a lot of the questions that usually come is, you put incident response and management at the very end, it's extremely important. It is, and they're not saying don't have an incident response plan, don't be prepared to respond in the event of an incident, right? Just the idea is do everything else first because this is supposed to happen after the fact, right? After somebody gets onto the network, after something bad is occurring versus right, everything else that comes before it is supposed to protect or prevent the bad thing from occurring in the first place. Right. Makes sense? And so I always go by the 80-20 rule, if you're familiar, right, or the Pareto principle. And the idea is probably more than likely 80% of our overall risk comes from 20% of our vulnerabilities. Right? Or we can have maybe the 80, most 80% 80 impact 
on our cybersecurity maturity level by implementing even just the first 20% of those controls. I still argue that out of all of these controls, the most important is vulnerability management because it actually touches on all of these. Okay. If I'm gonna go do a pen test, I wanna pull my vulnerability scan data. I know a lot of pen testers say, right, that we don't do vulnerability scans and it's not the end of the world. And we're gonna talk a lot about that in the rest of the conversation, right? We're not gonna lean on and we're not gonna just solely use vulnerability scans, but it's still a data set that we want to consult, right? Um, where, uh, where on that list would, would things like human er error, like, I, so, like for example, you leaving, accidentally leaving your admin username and password out on your desk, Hopefully not. <laughs> right. So the idea is these are all controls to protect the environment when something that, like that happens, right? Or what if, what happens when somebody clicks on that link in an email or opens up an attachment, right? Because we know someone is always going to click on a link or they're always going to open up the attachment, right? There's always going to be an infection in the network. There's potentially always going to be an attacker in the network at some point in time. Do we have any pen testers? So hopefully this conversation will kind of set you on that way. So yeah, so I spin, again, okay, I, you may watch Headbangers Ball like 20 years ago on MTV. Was it like, I always say they're like, one, was it like one foot in the gutter, you know, one fist in the goal? I, so depending on if you're on offense or defense, it depends on the gutter and the gold, I guess. Uh, you know, I live, those are the two worlds I, I live in. And, and we primarily still always focused on vulnerability management. We didn't really necessarily always have the ability to add pen tests. We would go out and we would engage outside parties to do those penetration tests for us, but we didn't do the internal testing ourselves until our internal audit team came to us and asked us to help them with their penetration test. So it's like, so I'm responsible for finding the vulnerabilities and fixing them, and then you want me to actually see if I can break into the systems that I'm protecting. So either if I can't break into the systems, I'm a really bad penetration tester, or if I can break into the systems, then I suck at my normal job. So I, it was, you know, Kind of stuff one, you know, one way or the other. I'm keeping it very uh, G rated, so, right? So, like I was mentioning, though, the idea is I still see as the main focus for organizations to really focus on vulnerability management, right? And that we are continually scanning the environment, and that's an automated part, right? And that's like still a little bit of what's that? Like in the fire software. Uh, there is no. It's constantly, it's constantly Whenever it detects a antivirus detects a vulnerable, uh, like a malware or something, it automatically he sends a message with additional security back to the head. Yes, in that way. Yes. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the automated vulnerability scanners that are out there. The big one is is still Nessus, I think, professional that most people will use. There's Open Vaz out there, which is open source. Uh, but then we will, and the conversation does turn into not just solely relying on those automated scanners and building in these pen test light activities, right, into your program that you should be doing, right? On one hand, and while, while humans are vulnerable, we also have a much, much wider, uh, wider range for learning, learning than a computer does. This is true. Well, maybe not all of us, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> we know what you mean. <laughs> so. I, I don't know about myself some days. <laughs> that's what coffee's for, I guess. Uh, so yeah, the idea with vulnerability management though is, and that's kind of the whole title of the talk, right? We want to be able to find the issues before an attacker does, or especially an auditor, right? Because I always, we'll have some examples of, and, and I do pen tests for other clients as well. And I hate, right, when somebody comes in and says, oh wow, we found this, issue and we were able to get domain admin credentials in you know half hour or less right so it, it has taught me hopefully to be a lot nicer and more empathetic when working with other clients as well when we go in to deliver those results so oh, that's up there so 
but we do want to be able to find those vulnerabilities and remediate them as quickly as possible. The other thing I like, and this is kind of where I have right one, one foot on each side of the fence, is that from an intrusion detection and response perspective, if an attacker gets on the network, right, by an employee clicking on a link or opening up an attachment, which we know will happen, right, they're going to then have to start looking for other vulnerabilities and gaining access to other systems and services. So they're looking for other vulnerabilities. If we're finding them before the attackers, that just means the attackers are going to have to spend a lot more time on the network trying to find ways to gain access to other systems and resources, which gives our intrusion detection teams a lot more time to be able to find them, right, and then kick them off the network, find out how they got on the network in the first place, and hopefully plug that hole. Like you mentioned, though, most of our holes come from our users, right? And it just goes back to that entire cycle of someone going to click on a link or open up an attachment. Right? So to go back over the basics, though, when we talk about vulnerability scanning in general, right, there's the, the four phases. We'll just go through these real quickly. But right, we can use an automated tool to scan across the entire environment. So at four, we use five Nessus Pro boxes currently to scan the entire network. It takes about 10 days because we are spread out globally. We do business in just about every country on the planet except for the big three like Iran, North Korea. We actually just pulled out of Libya probably six or seven years ago when the strife really started. Um, but we're going to scan, right? We're going to take those results and I've gone to clients before and said here literally is a hundred gigabyte Excel spreadsheet that'll take you an hour to open up in Excel, right, of all your vulnerabilities that you need to fix. What? Right? So we do go ahead and we prioritize those vulnerabilities right? on a scale of 0 to 10, or we say right, critical, the worst being the worst, and maybe a low risk, which we'll never get to. Right? We'll talk a little bit more about that. Right? We want to get those issues fixed, again, before whether it's an attacker or again, whether it's an auditor or some com somebody coming in to do a pen test is actually able to, to find those. Right? The whole idea is raising the level of cybersecurity across the organization. And we'll verify that the work was actually done. Just because somebody thinks they fixed it doesn't necessarily mean it's fixed. I've done it too, so trust me. So what I like to do is I actually like to do vulnerability scans without credentials because that is what will actually show you what a non-credentialed attacker will see at first and then go back and do it with administrative credentials. So then you can see additional information where the scanner can do things like log in to a Linux or a Windows box and see, are there missing patches, right? And then we could see there's additional exploits that are available, especially local privilege escalation exploits. Right? So we can do it with or without credentials. I like to do both. Yeah, it takes time, but we get a lot of really worthwhile information out of doing both. Right? We want to prioritize, again, we'll, we'll look at an example from Nessus where it goes from critical to low. But the idea is the critical are the worst of the worst, right? This is where somebody with no technical knowledge can exploit this vulnerability with a free tool that they download from the internet and they can have complete control over the machine. Right? Think Apache Struts Equifax. Right? My grandmother can pull it off, or I say my grandson who's seven, he could pull it off, right? I'd be, so. more, scared to, I'd be more worried about the, um, um, the seven-year-old because, because my Well, that's part of the joke, right? Yeah, if my grandmother can do it, yeah. Yes. Not being that, that savvy, right, that tells you it's, it's bad, right? So, again, yeah, we want to get things fixed. And this is really where we're going to take the rest of the conversation is, yeah, we understand, okay, there are the critical vulnerabilities out there. And those typically are usually fairly easy to spot, especially by an automated scanner. And we can get those fixed. The business these days understands, all right, let's get those holes plugged and move on with our lives. But a lot of what we're gonna talk about is the low hanging fruit that a lot of people overlook and that you aren't necessarily going to get a flag for something like an open share, a shared folder on a Windows system, right? That could present risk in a Windows environment or anonymous FTP. That's kind of OSCP rule number one, right? To see if I can log into an FTP server uh, anonymously and access data that's in it. Right, so that's what we'll talk about. 
And then again, we mentioned verification. And then we also want to, and this is very important from a vulnerability management perspective, we're always monitoring for new vulnerabilities. And especially we've seen this shift over the last couple of years, I think for a lot of folks in business, because if you don't, well, guess what? Your boss is or your boss's boss is. Because now we get those emails that says, hey, I was just looking in Forbes, right? Or our CEO was just reading in Wall Street journals about like not Petcha, right? Which we'll talk about at the end of last year. And they want to know, are we protected against this, right? Not Petcha caused more than $300 million to Maersk, right? Took down the largest shipping company in the world, right? And so our, of course, our leader for our company wants to know, are we vulnerable? And we need to be able to go back and say, yeah, we already knew about this. We're already monitoring. We've already scanned. We know where our vulnerabilities are and we know where we're patched and we can tell you that we're good, right? And that's usually what executives want. Are we good or are we not? So when you start looking at, and this goes back to also part of the, the presentation really is finding the vulnerabilities. Well, to find the vulnerabilities, we have to take a step back, right? And we have to know where our systems are. And so then we look at those from the outside perspective and then as well as the inside perspective. So when we talk about most organizations, most, that when I have systems that are connected directly to the internet, that's a, usually a very small number, right, compared to what I have in the rest of the organization. Right. For floor, and again, we're probably on the, the higher end of the scale, but we have about 150 internet facing systems that are open. Right. And then we have you know, 50,000 uh, just end user workstations spread out around the world. Right. Big difference. Right. So usually when we talk about internet facing, we see a much smaller number me, of networks, smaller number of computers and services. Right? And that usually everything can be fairly well documented because you had to go back and open up a firewall hole to allow that connectivity. But I will also tell you, we go to new organizations, we go to work with a client, and we always find something that's connected to the internet that the client didn't know about, right? Oops. And so we want to know about it, especially if it's vulnerable. So it, if it's supposed to be exposed to the internet, great, but let's get it secured, right? If it's not supposed to be there in the first place, let's go ahead and shut it off, right? When we talk about from the internal perspective, that's where especially automated vulnerability scans come into place, right? Because we have a much larger number of networks, much larger number of hosts. We see pretty much all of the services, all the applications that are running on the systems, and most everything could potentially be documented, right? That goes back to critical security controls one and two for asset management, right? Which organization has a list of all their systems right? and all the software that's installed on those systems? Mm -hmm. Some get close. And so what are the attackers and auditors looking for? I said, for me, what I've always seen is they're either focused on really the easy attack Right, which takes advantages of those critical vulnerabilities that most vulnerability scanners automatically look for. So that's why if we're looking at a tool like Nessus and I see a critical, yes, I want to get that fixed really quickly. But again, there's a lot of these low hanging fruit items that a lot of people in their enterprise vulnerability management programs are not looking for in any way, shape or form. Right? And so this is what we're going to get into for the rest of the conversation. So we do talk about, right, there are vulnerability scanners out there like OpenVAS. So when Nessus many, 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 many years ago, right, went closed source, and so you actually had to pay for Nessus, that OpenVAS was an open source version of that you could use for free, and you still can. It's not as fast, and it has you know, what, less than half the plugins or the vulnerability checks that Nessus does, but it's free. And there's a lot of awesome resources that built up around it. So it truly awesome, right? Great work. Most organizations will at least have an automated scanner, though, that they're paying for, like Nessus Professional, which is about $2,000 a year now. I tell if any, anybody, if your entire IT security budget is only $2,000, go buy Nessus and run the scans. It doesn't do everything, and I'm not saying it's a silver bullet, 
But for most organizations, it's a really great start, right? And we'll see why that's not also. But the idea here, you can see, not only do we find vulnerabilities, but we've gone ahead and categorized them by risk, right? So we see those criticals. Patch here first, MS17010, that's the vulnerability that was leaked, right, by shadow brokers that they borrowed from the NSA and that was responsible eventually for WannaCry and not catch it and all these other things. And it's one of those wonderful, very, very, very easy to use vulnerabilities because it works almost every single time. So we see there's high, which those are still pretty bad and we wanna to get to those. We just wanna do them after the criticals. And in most organizations, the mediums and lows, the informationals, you'll never ever get to because you're still spending time on the criticals, bless you, and the highs, right? And that's just the, the sad truth. I did doctor some of the slides, so this is actually a combination of your Windows and Unix server. I was gonna fix it, then I just kind of left it alone. Because you don't typically see X server running on Windows boxes, but I needed a low and I was in a rush, so. I used to make a pickup, so. And I think I've got all the IP addresses and MAC addresses uh, filtered out of all the slides, which would which be a good thing. But, so when you start talking about looking for other things on the network outside of the servers and the workstations, right, our laptops, right? So we can look for other types of services that fall outside of our normal baseline. Ideally, we try to have zero default SNMP community streams on the network, period, the end. When we see one pop up, we know to investigate and look, something is here. Not only did they use default community string, which from a security perspective is normally not the end of the world, though I have used them to take over network infrastructure before, which was fun. But the idea is in this case, we could see, hey, they had not only SNMP default community strings, but they were running Telnet. And so we could Telnet to the device. You could actually see it's running in setup mode, right? So nobody even touched it. So it's essentially default credentials, right? Or default factory settings. It, it just turned out to be one of the humidity and temperature sensors in, in one of the main data centers, right? So at the end of the day, this was fairly limited, right? And at the same time, we've seen issues. And you'll love the story about the thermostat at the casino in Vegas, right? That the, the thieves had used to, to, to funnel data and money out the, out the door, right? Potentially, right, there's still an issue, right? One of the other things in this we start looking at is you have to remember web applications are everywhere. Just about every IoT device and just about every industrial control system that you'll see has a web interface. And so I always preach now, if you're not learning web app security now, start. Right. I'm, even I'm definitely behind the curve on that. But the idea is just about everything these days comes with a web application front end. So we just start looking for web apps across the environment. And when something new pops up like this, this was somebody in one of the Asia offices that went and bought one of these little wireless access points. You can actually buy them here for 20 bucks off of Amazon. Right? And they wire it to the physical floor network and then they actually had 12 different people accessing it wirelessly. Of course, the kicker is they didn't change the default administrator name or credentials, so we could log in. We could see the name of all the devices that were connected. We could see their MAC addresses, and then, oh, well, we just kicked them all off, changed the password, shut the device down. That, that will negate it, right? And, like you can see if somebody starts screaming to figure out, you know, whose it actually was. So and they actually did have somebody complain and they got a corporate security policy violation for it. So these devices are out there though, right? This was another interesting case I thought because it was where we're scanning. We found a web application on a workstation. So usually we start thinking shadow IT, right? Somebody's doing something that they shouldn't, but Where's the translation? So right. <laughs> You know, I've been shadow IT before. I understand people are just trying to do their job. So it's like, hey, let's work with you to make sure this is done securely. 
In this case, we found this web application, if you hit the web server that was running on their workstation, it actually redirected you out to the internet, your browser out to this Chinese search engine. And so it, what happened was their workstation actually became infected with a browser hijack tool. And not only would it take their browser to this page, but it actually ran a web server on the workstation. So if anybody hit the web service, it would take them too. Thought that was interesting, right? They got a corporate security policy violation too. <laughs> Because they were they were doing maybe some not necessarily business. Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. And at home. So when we start looking at talking about finding you know our presences out on the internet. How many of you are familiar with Shodan? A few. How many of you are familiar with Census? Okay, so usually there's a discrepancy. A lot of folks know about about census and and, and showdown and and this is not the, the census and showdown talk, but the idea is like if I want to do a pen test or if I work for let's say Panera and I want to find where my presence out on the internet is, I can go to census, type in Panera, and like Shodan, both of those services scan the entire internet. Right? They index the information that they find. Now they're not scanning all 65,535 TCP boards, but they're scanning a couple dozen and they'll get most of the web servers. So if you have a web page out there that mentions Panera, right? or if you have a digital certificate that mentions Panera, you can actually pull those up through census. Shodan does it as well, but I think if you're just doing pure name searches, census will actually have a lot more usable results versus Shodan, which is more, hey, give us an IP address or a network range and we'll tell you what's on it. So usually I'll start with census to find the networks and the IP addresses and then switch to Shodan to do so. Oops. But really the rest of the presentation, I know we're kind of winding down, but this is an example of where I actually was trying to demonstrate to a client the dangers of WordPress. And if your WordPress sites aren't updated and secured, bad people can do bad things with them. And it's very easy. So in this case, and this is just an example I found off of the internet, but I found this site, Your Living Body, through Google, which has where they have the WordPress API, right, exposed to the internet, where somebody can go and upload content to the site. Does that sound like a good thing to allow just to be wide open to the internet? No, right? This is another, this is OSCP trick number two, right? In the, in the OSC book. So one of the tools out there, and then this kind of builds on, anybody heard of Spiderfoot? I'm sure you probably. So Spiderfoot, it's kind of, I got like the graphical interface that follows Recon NG. So Recon NG, uh, which was written by Tim Tomes, is supposed to automate the open source intelligence gathering process for you. Right? For a lot of people though, it's difficult to use because it follows the Metasploit interface, it's very command line driven, so it's not easy or accessible to everyone. Spiderfoot is, right? So you have a web interface, you literally can go in and say Panera.com, right? It's actually PaneraBread.com, which I found out through my use of Spiderfoot, right? But put in PaneraBread.com, right? And let it go off to the races. Well, what we started to find out was when I was looking at these different WordPress sites. So somebody was going ahead and hacking all these WordPress sites. Some of them are actually on the same hosting provider. Some of them were scattered across other servers all around the world. And they would hack the site so that way if a visitor went to the page, they would get redirected to the site called bestmeds.biz, right? Which is probably what you can imagine, right? It's, it's for, for online buying pills, right? So we did some, you know, some additional research. So I can go, you know, I can use Google dorks or specialized Google searches, right? Exploit database, the offensive security guys do an awesome job hosting the Google hacking database to give you some ideas. Uh, and you don't even have to go to this extent, but right, we can use Google search searches to find all of these pages on the internet. And so we started to look at all the connections and then we see the Stanley Spencer gallery. It's like, hey, it's an art museum, essentially, 
and buying Xanax online from Canada. Probably not their actual business model. Right? And so when you start looking at, yeah, here's bestmids.biz. And if you go to some of those pictures, one of them I think was the Seuss Group. And I send them an email and say, let them know, hey, you've been hacked, by the way. And the idea is if you went to the page, they're, they're high-end realtors for you know, Manhattan and then like Central Park apartments and, and then also like high-end uh, uh, real estate out in LA, right? And that it, if you go to part of their page, you can go, oh, here's where you get redirected to. Not part of their business model as well, I would, I would imagine. I did find it funny. So then, of course, oh, here's the little chat, right, that pops up. So I went back the next day and I thought, maybe it would be a good idea to actually talk to them and see. So in this case, I actually went back. I thought I was being super smart and setting, turning on my private VPN. So that way, I, oh, I saw the servers hosted in Germany. So I said, I'll make it look like I'm coming to Germany. And so they actually, it's hard to read, but they actually say, oh, they tell you, like right away, oh, hey, not to waste your time, we don't ship to Germany. It was like, oh, well, okay. Obviously, you're already looking at all of my information that you can pull at least from my public IP address that I'm coming from. thought that was interesting. And I said, okay, well, well, thanks for letting me know. Have a good day. All right. So go back a couple hours ago, made it look like I was coming from New York, right? And then have the same conversation. And there's other conversation. It doesn't take long to realize. It's just somebody, might be a woman, might be a man. They could be in a call center in Bangalore. They could be in a call center in Denver, Colorado. You, you never know, right? And the idea is they're just another person sitting there doing a job, right? Because when I, and I, they probably don't have a clue, right? When I say, oh yeah, our uh, site was hacked and that helped redirect me to your website. But you could technically build by pills. I wasn't going there, <laughs> right? And have them sent to you here in the United States without going to a doctor. Even though I think in the States, yeah, diazepam and Valium, you have to have a prescription for it. And then they even ask you to rate their service afterwards. So gave them a thumbs up. That was nice. So again, there's low hanging fruit out there though. And just to mention a couple to wrap up, Right? Looking for things like open shares. When your systems get infected, ransomware, crypto mining infections right, that want to spread, one of the ways they'll spread is by open shared folders on the network. When attackers gain access, they're going to start scanning for open shared folders on the network. You need to be scanning for them. And I do have a lot of slides, and that's partly not to throw everything in the kitchen sink. It's just to, so you'll have the references for later on. right? So you can see Nessus says, hey, you have eight instances of window shares. Could be good, could be bad. They could be all restricted. Well, if we start looking, well, Metasploit has a scanner to look for open shares. And in this case, oh, yeah, we found some default shares as well as a share for accounting, HR, and sales. One of those is wide open to the entire world. Kind of hard to tell from there, right? So. I love Nessus and all the Nessus scripting engine scripts <laughs> we have, right? This one is a little rough though. It doesn't give us a lot of information. The one tool, believe it or not, we use the most in looking for open shares because it's so easy and has this wonderful graphical interface is SoftPerfect, my network scanner, or network scanner by SoftPerfect, how about that? So the idea is I can run a scan on a system, right? all the information redacted, of course, but you can see on this 10.10.10.10, I have an accounting folder that's open to the world. Anybody can open that folder as long as they're connected to the network. They don't even have to have a user account. That's a red exclamation point. Right? There's a lock on the sales folder that says I'm not getting into it, and then there's HR folder open, that means it's read access only. So depending on what information is there, Right? The attacker can take that and use it to do other things on the network, right? which goes to the next one for anonymous FTP. Right? In this case, Nessus doesn't even say, hey, it's anonymous access. It just says you have an FTP server running. So then you can go back and I can run a scan for anonymous FTP servers. So can I log into the FTP server with a username of anonymous and a password of any email address I choose? Right? Joe at joe.com. 
And there's an SS, there's an nmap script to do that as well. And then, oops. And the story is we actually got um, a client where we had gone in, right? Found anonymous FTP server, log in. They, one of their web developers had stored their project files there. And in one of those project files, they had a text file with the default credentials for their web service. And then that web service had local administrative access to a system. So even though Nessus, right, an automated vulnerability scanner doesn't find an issue, it doesn't mean that there's not a critical issue there, right, which is really the point. So definitely do the automated vulnerability scans, but also you want to be taking the time to even build in those penetration light techniques to be able to look for those things that the scanners just aren't going to find automatically. One of the tools, and I don't put it in here, but it's built into Kali, um, is called Sparta, which will actually automate a lot of those, I guess low end, if we call them that, pen test techniques for you. And so if it finds a web server, it'll take a screenshot for you. So you don't even have to open it up in a browser. If it finds an FTP service, it'll try to log in anonymously. It'll let you know. If it finds a SQL Server service running, it'll try to log in with default or maybe some easy to guess credentials. So check out Sparta. But, and there's a lot of other slides. Like I said, I put a lot in there. But that, again, really brings us to kind of the end. Just a couple quick reminders. Again, there's just some recommendations. From my perspective, is vulnerability Vulnerability management still has to be a key aspect of anybody's security programs, right? It needs to be. It touches on all those different areas, right, that we saw laid out with the critical security control. Right? Work with the folks in IT, the system owners, to fix those issues based on priority, right? You don't want to give anybody a 100 gigabyte Excel spreadsheet, right? Change those risks that make sense to you, right? Just because Nessa says, oh, this is a medium risk vulnerability, that might be high or critical to you depending on your organization. Maybe you're in finance and that, that could be a, a compliance finding. We started to look at build open source intelligence into your vulnerability management practices. Put your domain name into Spiderfoot. Spiderfoot's free, it's very easy to download and run. And see what the results come back, right? See if you have any you know, hacked WordPress sites on, on your organization servers, right? Again, don't rely on just the scanners. Go build in those pen test light techniques at a bare minimum, and then always be looking for those web applications because they're out there. There are IoT, industrial controls, servers, workstations, shadow IT, right? They're out there just waiting to be found. So find them and take a look at them, make sure that they're supposed to be there, and if they are supposed to be there, secure them. If they're not supposed to be there, get them off the net. So thank you, everybody. Again, I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, and hopefully, some of you might make it up to Greenville. It's about three hours from Charleston. Um, we have a great show, I think, lined up. Doug Burks, is, Doug Burks from Security Onion is doing our keynote. Uh, we have a lot of local guys like Tim Tomes. Got, uh, Chris Sanders coming up from Canesville. Uh, we have a lot of great local talent. We're going to be at the Clemson Automotive Research Facility, which is a really exciting place. So we're expecting about 225 to 250 this year. Uh, for a second year, really awesome, uh, exciting show. Uh, and the uh, Clemson Automotive Research Campus is very, very techy and very cool. So, and feel free to reach out anytime if you just want to chat or catch up. So thanks again, I really appreciate it. Take care.